Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining in with us as we take some time to uh, spend a little bit of our Tuesday morning in consideration of the work of evangelist. Terry Francis is uh, present and uh, focused in on the message at hand. Uh, we're going to try to keep our points brief and to the point as we take some time to dissect uh, the process of preaching on the paper to the proclamation side of things. Like, how does that all play out when we move from I've got a subject or an idea that I need to share with my brethren? How do I go from that I have an idea to the finished product? Uh, and there's a lot of areas, at least in this, that are really important on the fundamental level. Uh, and so we've got a little format to kind of break it down. We're going to also include some of the various models of message delivery that come up beyond just topical textual and expository sermons, but really kind of thinking through the bigger picture because the goal is to present God's word in an understandable way that's harmonious with the text that accomplishes the goals that you've laid out. Like you, you always have goals with a sermon. It's not, not just to tell them what God said, uh, Preaching is persuasive. Uh, it's supposed to be a persuasive conversation in the end. So, um, Terry, uh, with with some of those guidelines, um, let's talk a little bit about the past for each of us to kind of give a background a little bit on uh, where we came from for, for this. Uh, for me, I did not start hearing sermons of any kind by any people until I was in college. So like, um, I don't have that backdrop of hearing different guys growing up and seeing their different methodologies. I learned that later. Um, and at a certain point, I, I had to knuckle down and teach myself how to make an outline and teach myself the good and bad parts of that process and learn through trial and a lot of error in order to arrive at a, a positive outcome. I know your pathway is a lot different with some mentors, with some structure. Um, and so let's get right into it. Uh, on your end, how did you get to the point where you're at with uh, your answers to some of the questions we're going to raise? Well, let me first say good morning. You said good afternoon. It's still morning. For both of us. Well, it's all about it. I started my day earlier than others. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll say this. I, I grew up going to church all the time and um, I probably heard lots of sermons, but didn't pay attention until I was almost in college. How about just brutal honesty about that? Uh, and even even through that, I think I think one of the things that people don't understand, and probably the, the non preacher listening to us is, I, I'm not sure they understand the differences in a lot of the things we'll talk about today. And um, so there's there's some there's some distinctions we'll make and. Uh, you know, in our in our pre-show kind of prep, you and I talked about just different terminology and some that we're not using necessarily, but um, even different kind of differences within these kind of categories. Um, but it's interesting to think about just the different styles. So while I was exposed to a lot of preaching growing up, a lot of good preachers in the congregations that I went to, um, a lot of good gospel meeting preachers uh, that came through where I was at, even as a child, um, I was the one who had to give up my bedroom when that happened. They stayed at our house. And so uh, remember those. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know that I noticed the difference or understood till later. And even admittedly, probably did not practice as much of a distinction this, of this as a young preacher as I should have, which I think is an interesting point to kind of make. Um, and I think as you mature in the work, and we obviously all, realize that's a process that you will get better at some of these things um, than you and I probably once were. You know, we're going to start off with topical sermons. And I'll tell you, my topical sermons when I started preaching were just awful. Um, and for kicks, sometimes I'll try to look for one of those outlines, although they were all paper back in the days of, I don't know if you remember when we started, uh, I had to have like two or three filing cabinets everywhere I went and probably about 10 years ago, I just got rid of all that stuff because it was, uh, first off, just a pain to store and um, to move around. And I have no file cabinets really to speak of anymore uh, because everything is done digitally. But I'll go back, even look at things that of my files that maybe even 
are now uh, my 21 pre years of preaching, probably about 14, 15 years old and still kind of shake my head and go, wow, that's, that's just awful. Um, and so you kind of grow in these different areas. At least that's the goal. So hopefully we'll talk about some of that today and, um, and hopefully strengthen other people and expose um, maybe the non-preacher to some of those distinctions and help them to see a little bit. Right. It's interesting that there are two areas where we take the least capable, least experienced, least skilled guys who could all get better in those areas. They can increase their capabilities. They can get their experience. They can increase their skills. And we do two things with them. One, we expect them to present topical lessons. All right, here's a topic. Go preach on it. Secondly, we expect them to do that in congregations that need maturity in the pulpit. And so these are growing new works. They're smaller works. They're challenging places. And so we give the least amount of talent, uh, strength, and experience and say, go do the two hardest things. Because it's my perception that topical lessons done well are actually the most challenging of our three formats. And by the way, the three formats we're using are probably the most common ones that folks are familiar with, but they are not the only structures you can use to generate a sermon. One of the ones we don't mention, we might hint at, is a narrative-based sermon. Those narratives can come from everywhere, uh, both personal life experiences, the culture around us, or the scriptures themselves, which is another format, if you will, for a sermon. Uh, but you think about these things um, from a very basic structural standpoint. In the end, though, we derive at this question, I need to say something. There's something pressing that the congregation needs to get better at that we need to strengthen or resolve around uh, and so we default to the topical material, uh, even though that probably is the hardest solution. And let me suggest that there's, that there's some better ways, and we're trying to get there. That's why we kind of have them laid out this way. So in the topical side, let me tell you a couple of things that don't do. And Terry mentioned this in his background as well. Uh, and I've talked about this elsewhere in uh, both written form and in these discussions. Don't get out your strong concordance or your Knave's topical Bible and open up to the topic section and write down all those passages in the order in which they appear and say, boom, my outline is done. I have covered my topic. I have addressed the subject, stand and sing. Um, even if you make the appropriate presentation of each of those individual passages and you give them the substantial context they need to be understood, you probably are gonna come off on the recipient side as uh, Terry is fond of saying, uh, in possession of a weaponized pulpit, uh, that you have taken um, this sermon and uh, really pushed hard on someone in a negative way, uh, that you've kind of uh, made it all about this issue. It doesn't mean the issue doesn't be discussed, but that methodology to arrive at the topical sermon really kind of lends itself to the feeling of, well, you were preaching about me, Mr. Preacher, uh, and I can yeah. tell you were preaching about me, Mr. Preacher, because you said these passages or said this thing, and I know you and I have been talking about this thing. Um, yeah. So that's on the negative side. Let me, let me say this in addition to that. That's one of the reasons why you and I are both big fans, by the way, of uh, preaching schedules and plans is it's very hard to accuse you of um, going after somebody, if you're just preaching a plan that you made months ago and you are focused on kind of a schedule, um, then that, that kind of protects you by being able to say, no, you know, this is just, this was just what was next. Um, now, yeah. and, 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 and so I just want to kind of throw that out there as a, as a positive for that, um, kind of practice. And the danger with the topical is, when you preach a topical sermon that is motivated by some issue that you're personally involved in or the congregation is involved in, even if your best intent is to not weaponize that, you probably still are going to to a little bit to, to, to some degree. Um, so I always would say if you find yourself in that, you know, you ever heard um, in soccer we we tell parents who are upset with the coach, you have to wait 24 hours to talk to the coach. And, Sometimes that needs to be 48. But uh, on these issues, I would also suggest if you just have to preach on that, 
take some extra time to cycle through that before you jump into that fire. Um, and I know that's not really what we're talking about, but just want to really give a lot of caution. You can do a lot more damage than good if you're not careful in that area. Right. Um, and uh, topical sermons, uh, you know, they often find themselves kind of uh, snaggletooth in delivery in that you've got some, sub, some sections of them that are longer than others. Uh, and so you end up kind of overextending yourself in different areas, and that creates an uneven delivery process where you've got, let's say you've got your classic three-point sermon. Uh, and so you got your three points, and it's all balanced, and you've alliterated like a champion. Um, and so you've got that included. But then in the end, your three points are imbalanced because your first point maybe is five minutes of your 35, 40-minute sermon, your second point is 10 minutes, and your third point is everything that was rest, uh, the rest of it. That's not a balanced message. That's not a balanced perception. Uh, even if all your stuff is correct, even if you're biblically accurate, um, you're giving undue weight to something uh, very likely in the, in the layout of the lesson because your methodology is kind of skewed a little bit. So my suggestion is set the topical-based sermon to the side. They're, they're powerful messages. Uh, and I really think that those are the lessons that you want your most experienced people approaching because of all the issues we've raised. We, bias is not uh, a magic thing you can wipe off the table. Bias will always yeah. be there. And that bias comes in animosity. It comes in misunderstandings. It comes in slanting of the issue. So set that topical sermon to I'll use that if I have to, if I absolutely must. Uh, and so my suggestion with topical sermons is put that at the end of the uh, option table. Yeah, and, and understand this. So one of the things we probably need to talk about in the context of topical sermons, and this will lead us into the other two, is that even though you're doing a topical sermon, you still have to do a lot of textual work in order to present that topical sermon. Um, and, and now, and, and that's the biggest difference between probably my preaching 20 years ago and today um, is 20 years ago, I would, I would just grab something. I would do a, uh, back then it was East Ord instead of blog off, but I would, you know, search for a word. Oh, that's a good passage. I'll use that verse. Uh, quite mm -hmm. honestly, lift it completely out of its context, not introduce its context, not talk about the context. I mean, I might say, hey, Paul wrote to Timothy. That may be the most of it, okay? And use that verse. And, and you know what? Probably eight times out of 10, that was okay in the sense that it made my point, but it wasn't as effective as it could have been. Whereas um, if you're going to do a topical sermon the right way, you really need to look at the text of the sermon. And you probably a lot of times need to talk about, now here's what this verse is saying in its original context, and here's how it applies. Um, and so that's why good topical sermons truthfully require a lot more work than um, the other two styles we're going to talk about, because instead of really diving into one text, you may have to dive into eight to fully understand what you're gonna say. Right, uh, and depending on what definitions you're using to describe the structures of sermons, you can look at the bulk of the teaching of Jesus and you really kind of look at it and go, man, he's just talking about topics. Um, sometimes you know, he does some stuff that I would classify more in a textual sense where he's got one or two Old Testament passages um, either a, a reference or two that he's kind of connecting to what he's going to say, but also his nature of his preaching is a little bit different too, because he teaches as one who has authority. So when he's speaking, he's speaking literally the text. Um, you and I can't do that. Um, and so we're not really in the same class. And so it's not really a, a super fair comparison, though there's some value there. And that's when I add that topical lessons aren't awful. It's just that we get a lot of topical lessons because we we ask the people less, the least skilled to produce them with the least amount of time, and we expect the most out of them. But really, it's just going to get the least. You know, you're you're going to have all these things that are just the, the lowest common um, skill sets producing the lowest common outcomes uh, in the end. So moving forward, then uh, Terry. Well, I was just going to say, just real quickly, when you look at the apostles, too, like in Peter and Acts 2, um, that's not really a textual sermon. It's more of a topical sermon with text interposed into it from the Old Testament. So 
you see that style a lot. And, and, and I'll say this, I, I think it's funny a lot of times, and I think it's why it's important to kind of point out that the Bible's full of topical sermons, because uh, we're really getting at some, uh, what I'll call preacher snobbery a little bit today, that there are some people who will say, um, you should preach only uh, expository preaching, by the way. Um, well, good luck with that, because half the expository preaching you're going to do is actually off of a topical sermon or text to begin with. Um, wow. So be careful in your snobbery towards different styles here. They all have their place, and I think that's one of the reasons we're going over this today, to remind us right. all the styles have their place. Now, there's some great balance there. And if you look at great communicators outside even the scripture and outside the Bible uh, subjects, great communicators will do all of the things we're talking about. They will make exposition of historical documents to communicate a modern message. Um, songs do that uh, a lot. You know, you look at th things that talk about old glory as an example and talk about the American flag. Well, all the poetry that exists about the American flag is used as exposition to teach another thing. So. This is a communication tool. So again, and we'll probably touch back on topical at the end. You move into the textual context. As we're using it here, we're talking about a small portion of an Old or New Testament text. Two, let's, for our purposes right now, let's say one to four verses. Um, you know, anything more than that, we're gonna say, that's an overview, that's gonna be a, a type of large chunk exposition that we'll talk about in a second. But this textual bracket that exists in the mi middle kind of prevents your outcomes of being so narrowly focused because it forces you, if, you're, if your goal is to do a good job, it forces you to stay in the narrative context of the letter or the historical book or the prophecy that's being written. And so by doing that, you take some of the difficulties off the table for poor communication. Um, you, you're, you're gonna require yourself to understand who wrote it, when did he write it? What was going on in the culture? What was going on in the lives of the believers? What are the other big thematic ideas that God is trying to reveal to his people? Um, and a lot of times, and by the way, if you're looking at how to kind of schedule these things out, Barry and I both over the years have preached through um, Old and New Testament books. We've incrementally gone through them. Sometimes what you're doing is you're bouncing from exposition to textual lessons in that process where you may cover a chapter one week and the following week you may cover four verses from the same book. And so you're actually navigating this kind of gray zone that exists between the two all the time. Um, so in that process of laying those things out, it forces you to reconsider things in the context of what did God actually say? Uh, and what was his, his point? Uh, and I, am I doing justice to the text with the point that I think I need to hear? Um, uh, so that's where this textual, textual stuff comes in. Um, and it is also really common in the Old and New Testament. Um, you, you see the prophets presenting the story of the Messiah throughout the Old Testament. And in the letters and the work of Christ, he pulls that story forward and says, you have heard it. It was written. It now speaks of me. The prophets speak. Um, they never spoke. So the, the apostles do this basic premise a lot. Um, Terry, in your transition from what we'll both acknowledge as bad topical stuff, what was the aha moment that made you realize this is what I need to do? Or if you can remember uh, memory back that far. I, I, don't, I don't remember any specific aha moment except for uh, I think as you read more and you talk to other guys more and you listen to other people more, you kind of realize and figure out that what I'm what I'm doing is not where I need to be. Um, I will probably say that it's not an aha moment, but a, um, a relationship I've had for a long time with another preacher that through our private discussions, which is sometimes as often as daily, um, in just watching what he was doing and how he was doing things and realizing I wasn't measuring up, that probably was an iron sharpens iron kind of relationship continues to this day. Um, and so that probably is what molded me in that area the most uh, in that sense. Um, but, you know, in this textual area, uh, one of the things that I, I like to do on that is um, is take your time to uh, a typical, and it's, it's sometimes like a narrative, especially if it's a, a something that's a story more than just a, 
a large chunk of scriptures. And that may take you more beyond a four verse section, by the way. Um, but a lot of times I'll tell the story of this text and then just make some general applications. That's not quite what we would call an expository sermon, which we'll get to next, um, that dives a little deeper. Uh, but I will tell you what that allows you for is it allows you along the way in those areas to, to cover things in a more non-weaponized fashion than the topical often would. You know, if, you, if you've got a problem, um, let's say that just with unity and fellowship, you, you, you can see that in a lot of text out there. You can make that application as a sub-application to a greater text without people feeling like, oh, here are the preachers after us again kind of thing. Um, and so when we think about specifically this kind of idea of you've got something you need to, to preach on, um, this is a great way to do that. And this is far less offensive than a lot of our topical sermon approaches can be. Um, and so that's that's one way to think of this, I think, in that sense, that, that, that it's a subset of the text rather than the entire point of your 35 to 40 minute sermon. Right. And uh, in this process of kind of figuring those things out, remember this, um, the Bible is full of real life people struggling with, in essence, the same struggles that are common to man. Uh, and so whatever issue that's struggling, that, that gave rise to, I need to preach on this subject, it's probably there somewhere in the text. Uh, and as a parallel for you, you know, I noticed as I kind of reflect back on uh, my work in Tennessee and other places, we have ups and downs in the way we develop our, our preaching ability, uh, where there are inputs to us that challenge us to get better. Uh, and I, I think right now I'm kind of thinking about all the guys that are kind of preaching in places where there's nobody else around them. There's no one to be that iron sharpened irons guy in the way that preachers get treated. You know, day one, you're the young preacher, you're supposed to know stuff. And so many of the members, unreasonably so, will look at you and think, well, this guy knows the things. And so you end up with an inequality there that means that your sword, if you will, doesn't get any time on the grinder uh, where you get to kind of correct. Um, and I noticed that at different points in, the, in my work in Tennessee and in my work in uh, Oregon and Louisiana that, hey, there were points there where I was kind of alone. Um, I've made it a point over the last few years, particularly, to expand the network of people who are willing and able to tell me you're wrong. You need to do it yeah. this way. Or even look at them and say, like you did, that dude's really good at this thing. I want to get yeah. good at that thing. Let me ask him how he does it. Um, you know, uh, I'll use an illustration. Ryan Firm, who's a member of the congregation at Brentwood, is tremendous with um, digital media and website development. And pretty much, if you look at the Brentwoods website and something comes on the Facebook page or something like that, I'll tell you, Ryan probably touched the product at some point from beginning to end because he's really good at it. Um, so I talked to him and I said, tell me things. And Ryan's a, a good 15, 20 years younger than me. Um, there's nothing wrong with uh, folks understanding that, hey, those are things that we need to do. We need to have that shift. And so for connecting it to where we're at, your preaching should go through those developmental stages of it's good, but it can be better so that I can do my present tense best. Um, and textual sermons are a great branch out there. Um, uh, moving forward, uh, and like Terry, I hear a lot of folks leaning healthily into uh, expository preaching is the best preaching style or method or structure. And to a certain degree, um, I live in a realm that leans in that direction, but here's why. Um, it forces you to work with the text in ways that a topical lesson allows you to be lazy. Um, right. And so that's really where I think the edge exists. It's not that one's better than the other as a natural component, is that the structure means you're gonna have to do some things that you just simply won't approach. Uh, in other methodologies. You just won't sit there and, and work through them, uh, especially in a scheduled series lessons where you can't skip a passage uh, and, and you're expected to, to work through them all in sequence. Yeah, and let me say this. I, I think it's interesting that, um, and by the way, I don't have any scheduled, uh, what I would call expository sermons 
series right now, although we're focusing on the cross, which is more of a textual just because we're not moving through like one account. Um, but I'll, I'll, in the past, one of the things I've done is taken one Sunday a month and focused on going through a book, um, which is um, usually an epistle. I've also done, um, you know, you we talked earlier. I, one year, I also, in addition, went through all the minor, pro, all the majority of the minor prophets once a month, and just did one lesson, which, by the way, um, was a good idea. So you get to Zechariah in 35 minutes, which is impossible. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, we talk about issues coming up in churches. If you're moving through an epistle, let's say you move through First Corinthians over the course of a year to year and a half, or you schedule to move through. Um, Ephesians and Colossians consecutively in a year. Pick those because it's a, you know fits a twelve month schedule. Um, if you were to do that, uh, most of the issues that you probably find yourself needing to speak on are going to come up within that expository series, yeah. and you can do you can handle those issues within the context. And again, we've kind of moved from what has the most potential to be the most offensive to the very least offensive along the way. Now, right. at, at the end of that, let me say this to the younger preachers. If, if you're a young guy, you're going to be more tempted to use the topical sermon, but you need to be actually using probably the expository series first and work your way skill-wise towards the topical. If you will focus on developing the expository kind of ability with the text, it will in turn make your topical sermons better later on when you move towards that. Uh, right. And that's in some ways why I think this is so valuable to emphasize the expository preaching. And I didn't do that when I, I don't know about you, Phil, but I didn't do that early on in my preaching. I was the exact opposite, which was a mistake. Yeah, I, I kind of fell flat at a certain point after I moved as Clark Duggar would refer to it, my extra long gospel meeting in Louisiana to Oregon, um, and realized that that's what I needed to do for a couple of reasons. One, the background of my family and not having that grounding in the scriptures when I was young, um, not knowing how to schedule out about this stuff. There were not the resources available. The internet was not like it is now for the relationships of preachers. Those things didn't exist. And so I just started preaching through Bible books. Um, I really didn't put much thought into the sequence because I didn't know how to put thought into the sequence. But I knew if I started just preaching through the text, then I would grow somehow. You know, I knew that those were going to be outcomes. And the hope was that my hearers would grow and I would improve and everything would eventually kind of incrementally get to a point where some understanding on my part could take place. Uh, and this is in the midst of starting a family and doing all the other stuff. And so um, it, there was not, I wish it was some like grand plan. It was, I have no idea what I'm doing. So I'm going to do this. Um, and uh, you pull it off the top of the shelf and you say, I'm going to preach a lot of Old Testament, like preach to the minor prophets, preach through some of the epistles, um, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and they have Sunday evening lessons. That was going to be minor prophets, uh, right? One after another. Uh, and I didn't bind myself up into trying to do it in one setting. It was, I can do as much as I can do. Uh, we could call it the Brent Kirchival method if we want. Uh, uh, for uh, He is far more efficient and organized about it, though. Uh, his is much more successful than mine was. So I think that's a powerful kind of thing. That, look, do that. Because in the end, if you think about it, a quality topical ses uh, sermon exists on the foundations and the triad of some pyramids of expository uh, studies that relate to the textual sections that come out in the application and the topic. Um, I kind of have this idea that if you're studying something and you're building a library, you want to have at least three editions of a, a, a level of depth on a subject. And so if you're looking at the text of Genesis, uh, uh, a devotional level commentary, which is kind of a surface look, is your beginning look. You want to have three of those already kind of studied through before you look at a standard commentary, which is going to be more technical. And if that doesn't satisfy your depth right there, you're going to have to have three of those. And once you get that triad down, 
then you can reach for an advanced one because you're going to need the information and uh, and you may have gone through this process where you've now read nine devotional level commentaries to understand three standard level commentaries to understand the one advanced commentary that deals with technical issues of language and context in a more complicated fashion to answer a question about one passage. Well, that's kind of how a topical sermon kind of ends up being, where you're going to go through these sequential layers of, I know more, now I know more, now I know enough, now I know more than I think I need, but I still want to make sure I understand it well to get to a point where you can present it. Let me let me give a word of caution about all that because that's that's how that works. Here's what doesn't need to happen though. I think um, as preachers, we don't need to get up in the pulpit and make sure that everybody knows that we've read 14 commentaries to give you this point. Um, and and that's I think one of the you need to put that much work in, and and you need to understand a lot of those technical things. But that doesn't mean you need to show everybody you understand those technical things. Our job is to take that technical thing and make it so that the fourth grader can understand it in a way that makes sense to them. And that's your goal. And I think just to just to make sure guys understand, we just need to be careful that we are not, um, you know, with all the Greek and all the, just be careful about that. Just a word of caution about how you present all of that. Right. Um... Uh, if the audience does not speak Greek, then quoting Greek um, is challenging, uh, and it creates potential conflicts. Um, if the audience doesn't speak Hebrew, Aramaic, uh, Latin, German, then quoting from those various historical books and uh, tidbits can be challenging because um, they have no means by which to evaluate the weight of what you're quoting. Um, they're not that, that's not their skill set. They're good at other stuff, and so stay stay wise to that. Um, let me add this tidbit. I, I'll mention them here. I'll try to show them, throw them up on the, uh, in the comments in a second. There's two great websites that I use a lot. One of them is Grammarly um, to help refine the message. This is kind of a side point. And the other one is the Hemingway app. The Hemingway app is neat because it simplifies what you're going to say in a directive sense. So you, someone like me who unintentionally has picked up way too many big words, um, I always make sure I try to narrow it down, um, you know, uh, is to, to get it to a more palatable way where I'm not using so much of an extended vocabulary, especially like for you. I know you do this, and I do this too. When I've got something I want to say a certain way, I write it out. Uh, yeah, I there's a particular that's the, key. that's the key to that. If you're if you're the ad lib guy that has a half a page of notes. You can't use Hemingway or Grammarly because you have nothing to input there. Um, so a requirement here is some planning on your part. Yeah, you know, and so, uh, and you know, Saltz, who actually is competent in Greek and skilled in Hebrew, um, noted that most of the folks you see quoting and citing from Greek or other languages are the ones that are probably the least skilled in the language. Um, uh, and I would say that um, my anecdotal experience kind of matches that from the yeah. pulpit, listening to people preach from the pulpit, um, least skilled participant making strong assertions that in the Greek it means um, is a, a real risky approach from the, the public side. Uh, so in our. Let me say this real quick. Know who, know who you are in all of this. Like, and I think that's yeah. kind of what we're getting at the end. Um, I, I was going to say this earlier, but now, and I chose not to, but now that Jared's here, I'm, I'm going to, or made himself seen, I'm going to say it. Um, I'm not Jared Salt, so I don't want to pretend like I am, right? <laughs> and for most of the people listening, you're not Jared Salt either. And what I mean by that is Jared's got a really good grasp of uh, Hebrew and Old Testament, um, things that I, I, I learn a lot from his post and from our conversations. But I don't need to get up and regurgitate that in the pulpit thinking that I am Jared or pretending to be. And so in all of these things, there's a lot of things you're going to run across that is going to give you some enlightenment and some understanding. But don't get up and pretend like you're something you're not in regards to that when you preach. And that's just kind of a bonus side note to all of this today. Um, and, and 
just just make sure that we kind of keep all that in perspective. Be who you are in all of that. Right. Um, and in the end, you'll be more effective in that regard. And by the way, no one wants to be Jared Saltz anyway. I mean, let's just be fair. Uh, Jared Saltz doesn't want to be Jared Saltz. Let's be honest. <laughs> um, uh, especially when he's on the Whole30 diet like he is right now. Uh, so yeah. uh, he's hating life. Uh, and I'll add this, and this is a point to kind of catch it. We're talking about these structures because they're the methods we lean, uh, lean into to deliver God's word to a people who need to hear it. And being authentic with yourself is important. My, my wife pointed out to me, uh, who is way smarter than me about all this stuff, that for years I didn't really uh, embrace humor in my preaching. Uh, I was very uncomfortable with it on the, on the pulpit side of things. Uh, but those who have known me over the years, I love, you know, messing around and joking. It's only been the last couple of years that I've really embraced it. Uh, even my sister-in-law mentioned it. Phil makes jokes that are funny when he's preaching. There was a surprise to her because for years I really didn't. Um, uh, you know, it was really kind of something that I was not comfortable with because I probably wasn't yeah, comfortable I've, with me. I've had that same struggle. <laughs> yeah, Terry's never had that struggle. <laughs> Terry steps into the pulpit and people wonder, is this, is this a joke? Yeah, that is true. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But I think it's just really important. That that's part of the process. Now, there's a couple of things that we didn't mention in this triad of structures that are really important. Um, they're not the only ways to frame a message. Um, and God does this a lot um, in regards to the Old Testament. The Old Testament is full of echoes of themes. We're talking about types and the A-types and all those little structural stuff, but you see repetitive storytelling where the same basic structure of a story is told again and again. Um, that's a powerful way to structure lessons that we need to hear that's God-defined and God-utilized. Um, and so leaning into those narrative structures, the literary structures that are in the Bible, helps us then create a format that people will remember it again. Um, and we do that with storytelling, with the narrative sermon model, which is, was popular for a while. It's kind of not as popular as it used to be, but we take a story people know, and then we subvert it to our own purposes to teach a truth that God taught. Uh, in the Old Testament, you see repeated themes of like woman of the well. You see themes of negotiations between nations. You have these themes of uh, mom, uh, mom's son. Like, uh, you know, I joked uh, last week that uh, you know, you could almost make a sermon out of helicopter moms or lawnmower moms, uh, the Old Testament and God, because you think about how often in the Old Testament, that's the story. A mom made something happen for their son. Uh, uh, by the way, that's not a sermon topic anyone should preach. Uh, it, it went into the not a good idea category from my perspective. But if you can make it good, you run with that. I know I shouldn't do it. Um, but all in those three categories you've laid out, those are structures that are approachable, that are reachable for you and I. And in many ways, um, you know, um, those are things that we can then use to get to a point where we're doing a better job of our goal, which is to relate to people what God said and to teach them what God said. Um, and so at those starting points, young preachers, guys who are just starting this work, lean into exposition of the text, chapter, two chapters at a time. It will help with your Bible classes. It will help with your sermons. It will help with your relatability to people. And then gradually begin to figure out how to mix these other issues in. Uh, if someone comes to you and says, hey, we really need a lesson on social drinking, I'm going to suggest to you that two things need to happen. Either A, that guy needs to preach it and let him take the bullet for the conversation. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let's hope he's a shepherd. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and even then, he probably doesn't. <laughs> but instead, start looking at some of the sections of the history of, the, of God's people where alcohol, and this is the illustration of it, was a major factor in the outcomes. Uh, and there's lots of them. Uh, and you'll find that many of them aren't necessarily as awful, horrible as you want them to be because you're trying to fit a definition. But a lot of them are worse than you thought it would be. Um, and so you're going to get some narrative sections of the Old Testament that deal with the question and people are going to be like, oh, yeah, definitely don't want to do that. Uh, rather yeah. than let me tell you about how uh, wine was made in the first century, as if you and I are experts on how wine was made in the first century. Um, you know, that, that we were hanging out at the, at the bars, if you will. 
um, uh, neither of us, at least for Terry and I, can speak with confidence that we are not experts on first century wine. Um, I might be an expert on tacos. I, I think I could probably say that to a certain degree, I have some expertise there. Um, and maybe one or two other things, taco adjacent. To so Terry, what else you got for us? Uh, any, any grand wisdom in regards to um, what to do um, with this basket of how do I approach a subject? How am I gonna make that decision? Because we're gonna move to one, one other edge at the close. I'm a mature-ish preacher now. When do I use a topical sermon? We're old. Uh, we're old. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I probably still probably preach more topical than I would like at times, but they're just different in their approach. Um, you know, one of our series is on prayer. Those are all topical sermons. Now, there's a lot of huge chunks of text in those. Um, another series is on the home. Again, huge chunks of text in those, but but those are generally topical. Um, I I could have I could have incorporated and wove those in through a textual study like like I often do and will if I go through Ephesians, let's say. Um, but at the same time, there's not an allowance to do some things uh, like this past Sunday when I talked to grandparents. Uh, you're going to do a sermon on grandparents, which I think is something a lot of people don't talk about, but probably a good thing to talk about. It's going to end up being a topical sermon for the most part, unless you go find a narrative about grandparents. It's probably not gonna make the points that you want. Um, so uh, let, me, let me say this to kind of wrap it up from my perspective. I think the key to all of this is balance. Um, there's not one way to do this. In fact, you really need to realize um, if you find yourself just doing all expository preaching you're probably neglecting some things in the process. If you find yourself just doing all topical preaching, you're neglecting things in that process. Um, you, balance is the key to all of this. And I think that's the most important thing to really encourage uh, all, of, all of our brother preachers out there, just find the balance in handling all of this. Um, and on the topical, if it's a response to something, never be afraid to let somebody overlook that and, and edit that for you and let you know whether or not what you're about to say is going to be too harsh, which again goes back to planning, writing out what you're going to say, which I'm a big fan of because of this very reason. Um, right. You can kind of have that approved by somebody else before you get up and blast somebody from the pulpit. And if it's one of those deals, then you stick, I'm going to use this terminology, you stick to the script when you preach it to make sure that you don't get off and weaponize yourself in the process. Right. Because the goal, like with this edge right there, you don't want to destroy the relationship needlessly just because you think you've got to grandstand. And today's the day where you're, um, you're, the, you're the chosen one. Because I'll just tell you on a frank level, we're not. Um, your relationship with your brethren can be so harmed just because of some of these avoidable missteps that um, you end up undoing any good work you've done over the years. Uh, and not, neither of us and none of us really want that outcome, especially when we have a chance to avoid it. Um, so I tend to kind of move away from that edge. Now, I'll still preach topical lessons because they fit the theme. Uh, they fit in the middle spaces between expositions of text. Uh, and this point just uh, I had it written down, I kind of pointed, forgot to mention it earlier. If you look at your outline and all of your scriptural citations are only one verse long, um, you better be really certain that that's exactly what you want to say. Um, I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying that you're you're moving out into the edge of riskier and riskier sermon design processes, um, you know, where you're allowing everyone to assume that what you're saying is fully accurate to what God intended to say. And that's part of this process. So for me, on the other end, a topical sermon is gonna be employed when it is really the only option, uh, that I can't approach it from an expositional standpoint, I can't approach it from a larger textual standpoint, in order to give sense to God's plan, I'm gonna to have to kind of 
work from here's the topic and we're going to have to pull in a larger basket of ideas to explain it and sometimes that's how it is um you know and there's little that you can do to get around it but in my estimation that should be the last thing you pull off the shelf um, now once you have those structures uh, whether it's topical textual expository you can still apply some suit dressing to it um, and give some different delivery devices some some shifts uh, one of the things and i'll leave this as the end you can do an exp exposition of a, of a book and have five chapter book and you can give each of those chapters their own topics and make it feel like a topical idea but you're really just doing ephesians 1 ephesians 2 ephesians 3 ephesians 4 um, and that's a great way to make use of this to teach a couple more things and so you can kind of do stuff like that and let god guide if you will the topics you choose because they're textual in nature they're coming straight out of the, the text itself. Uh, in the future, uh, we'll probably take some time to break down some more, some of the methodologies involved in what goes into building these lessons, because that's not what we're doing here. We're not talking about how to build a great expository sermon. We're saying these are the formats you get to typically pick from. Here are some pluses and minuses. Um, and if we've had some folks kind of drop some questions in the course of the broadcast and some comments, uh, if you've got questions about some of this stuff, I'm happy to answer those uh, in this format in future conversations. I know next week Terry will be uh, alone if he can find his own sidekick, which he probably can. He'll do, do something. Terry, do you have any idea what you're doing next week uh, on Tuesday whatsoever. when I will be otherwise occupied? We are completely clueless. So um, if anybody would like to make suggestions, send me a private message or uh, otherwise it will be an interesting discussion, I am certain. Uh, well, I hope it's an interesting discussion with somebody else, unless it's just a discussion with you, uh, then that would truly be interesting in many ways and maybe a little bit uh, uncomfortable. If it's just me, I'll have to do two different voices to make it more entertaining. So let's pray that I find a companion. Yeah, I think I think we'll be able to work that out. Um, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for listening again uh, and participating. Uh, if you've got questions about this, happy to answering any of those. If you go to YouTube, you can find us there. Uh, if you go to the archives on the Facebook page, you can find us there. And we're about a week or two out from being able to place all of this in an audio format in a podcast that will be listed as well. Because I know some folks don't have the time to sit down and stare at their faces, but we're interested in just kind of listening to the conversation and the dialogues. And so they're all there. Uh, they're unedited. Uh, we don't fix any mistakes afterwards. And so uh that's just how it is and you deal with the consequences terry last shot Excellent. and then we're out uh thanks for joining us and as always uh promote share and send us messages if you want us to cover something specific y'all have a great day <laughs>